Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. I do want to encourage you to check out my wife's business, Ashira Clips. There she sells a wide variety of different headbands, hair pins, and hair clips to fit a wide variety of different styles and tastes. You can check these out at lilarose.biz. That's L-I-L-L-A Rose dot biz slash Ashira, A-S-H-I-R-A. That's Lila Rose dot biz slash Ashira. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of Mr. Chameleon. The original air date on this one is April the 13th, 1949, and the title is The Amazing Thomas and Blifton Murder Case. Next, Mr. Chameleon and the amazing Thomas and Blifton murder case. Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Headquarters in his most famous cases of crime and murder, brought to you by the makers of genuine Bayer aspirin. Mr. Chameleon, as you all know, is the famous and dreaded detective of Central Police Headquarters who frequently uses a disguise or impersonation to confuse the criminals he is tracking down. In tonight's case, he appears in a particularly clever disguise, which the audience will at all times recognize. Tonight, we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Amazing Thomas and Blifton Murder Case. Our story opens in the office of the Commissioner of Police, a man who is seldom surprised by anything. But now, as he sits talking to Mr. Chameleon, the astute and dreaded detective, he is saying, Here's a funny thing, Chameleon, one of the strangest situations I've been up against in years. See this letter? It's from a man named Thomas, asking police protection on the proposition that he's certain his business partner is out to murder him. Well, what's so funny about that, Commissioner? We're always getting letters like that. Let me finish my story, Chameleon. On the same mail, I had a letter from Thomas's partner, also asking for police protection. He claims Thomas is out to murder him. Partner's name is Blifton. Blifton? Wait a minute. I know who those birds are. Thomas and Blifton is the firm name. Uh, One of the boys from the district attorney's office told me only yesterday they're about ready to put the finger on Thomas and Blifton. What? Mm Mm-hmm. It seems the loving little partners have been selling fraudulent securities, mostly to widows and professional people. Now they want to kill each other. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, What'd you do about it, Commissioner? I sent a couple of our second string men down there to find out what it's all about. As a matter of fact, Chameleon, I... Oh, just a second. Commissioner of Police speaking. Oh, Foley, I was just telling Chameleon... What's that? No. Okay, I'll send them down immediately. Chameleon, that was Detective Foley, reporting on Thomas and Blifton. They're dead. Both of them, Commissioner? Both of them. Get down to their office as quick as you can. And a little later, Mr. Chameleon and Detective Sergeant Dave Arnold are standing in the private office of Thomas and Blifton, 
staring at the two prosperous-looking men who sit still and lifeless on either side of the desk. And Dave Arnold says... Look at that, will you, Mr. Chameleon? Both of them dead. And they died at the same time, Dave. There they sat, discussing whatever they were discussing. Life was snatched away from them almost the identical moment. Let's take a look at the glasses in front of them. What were they drinking, highballs? Liberally spiked with poison. See, this is Thomas's glass. Hmm, smells bitter. And Blifton's. Oh, that's odd. What's the matter, Mr. Chameleon? Well, I can't tell for sure till we get the uh, analysis, but I would swear there were two different kinds of poison used. Don't tell me they killed each other. Well, I wonder, Dave. That's what they were both afraid of, according to their letters. Who was the first person to get here after Detective Foley discovered the bodies? Carrie Clark, the little typist. Uh -huh. And then a guy named Thurston, the general manager of the company. And a woman named Harriet Brown, who sold securities for the firm. They're all outside. Mm-hmm. Dave, I'll see them in this office. Here, Mr. Thurston first. Mr. Thurston, Mr. Chameleon will see you now. Great, sir. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Chameleon. I've followed a number of your cases in the papers. Thank you, Mr. Thurston. We'll talk about my other cases later. Right now, I'm interested in the double murder of your employers. Amazing, isn't it? But frankly, Mr. Chameleon, not surprising to me. Not surprising, Mr. Thurston? Why? Because within the past week, both Mr. Thomas and Mr. Blifton came to me independently and said he was sure the other was out to murder him. In other words, Blifton told you his partner Thomas was out to murder him, and Thomas told you that he was sure that Blifton was planning to murder him. Exactly, Mr. Chameleon. Did they tell you that they had both written the police asking for protection? Thomas for protection against Blifton, Blifton for protection against Thomas. They did. You knew nothing of these letters, Mr. Thurston? That's queer. All I can say is, neither Thomas nor Blifton mentioned the letters to me. Besides, what difference does that make? It's pretty clear to me what happened. What did happen? They killed each other. Not much question about it. Detective Sergeant Arnold, you taking down everything Mr. Thurston says? Yes, Mr. Chameleon. Now, what is this, Mr. Chameleon? Why should everything I say be taken down? Just routine, Mr. Thurston. Don't be alarmed. Oh, I see. But it disturbs me. Well, don't let it, Mr. Thurston. I'm sure you're trying to help me. In every way I can, Mr. Chameleon. Uh, you know, of course, that the firm, a firm of Thomas and Blifton was shady. Both partners crooked. I was just catching on to it, and in fact, I was looking for another job. How long have you been office manager here, Thurston? About six years. Yeah, it took you a long time to find out, didn't it? Now, look here, Mr. Chameleon. Did you ever sell any of Thomas and Blifton's shady investments yourself, personally? Never. Selling the securities wasn't my job. Then who beside the partners themselves did sell them? That is to say, which employee here baited the suckers? Miss Brown. Harriet Brown. She's clever. Detective Sergeant Arnold, bring Miss Harriet Brown in here, please. Come in, Miss Brown. Ah, Miss Brown. Uh, Mr. Thurston has just been telling me you're a very clever woman. Awfully nice of him, I'm sure. Now, what can I do for you, Mr. Chameleon? Well, for one thing, you can tell me what your version of this murder is. They killed each other, precisely what I expected them to do. Why, Miss Harriet? Well, it doesn't need a detective of your reputation to answer that, Mr. Chameleon. Both Mr. Blifton and Mr. Thomas openly told me he expected the other to murder him. And if you ask me, I think they told me this to throw me off. Each one actually planned to kill the other. I see. And in that way, got himself in the clear. Well, you are clever, Miss Harriet. I'm beginning to see what Mr. Thurston meant when he said that you were. Just what did you say about me, Mr. Thurston? I, I only... Uh, sorry, I'm doing the talking. What he told me, Miss Harriet, is that you were the person here who baited the suckers. What? The person who sold worthless securities to helpless confiding people of moderate means. Ill circumstance to lose their money. That is completely untrue, Mr. Chameleon. All I did was follow up prospects after Mr. Thomas and Mr. Blifton had mailed them circulars offering certain stocks for sale. In other words, you... She were... telephoned them, Mr. Chameleon, and said that what the circular offered was something very special. Something reserved for a few favorite customers of Thomas and Blifton. Aha, uh -huh, I get it, Thurston. The come-along girl with a pretty voice. And Mr. Thurston wrote those circulars and the letters himself, Mr. Chameleon. There is one thing certain, Harriet. You and Thurston agree perfectly on one point. Almost too perfectly. 
Agree on what, Mr. Chameleon? That the murdered men, Thomas and Blifton, killed each other and told both of you their troubles beforehand. Does that mean you think Harriet and I killed them, Chameleon? Maybe yes and maybe no. Well, take it flat, Mr. Chameleon. Thurston and I didn't. How could we have? They killed each other. No, they did not. A third person did. And it could have been either one of you. When crooks get together, anything can happen. You can't accuse me of murder, Chameleon. I suppose by that, Mr. Thurston, you mean he can accuse me. Now, Mr. Chameleon, please. Later, Miss Harriet. Dave, uh, will you bring in the little typist, Carrie Clark, please? Right in here, Miss Clark. Uh, Carrie Clark is your name, and you're a uh, secretary here, right? Yes, Mr. Chameleon. Now, these two letters were received at police headquarters. One signed by Mr. Thomas, one signed by Mr. Blifton. Each one claims the other one had threatened his life. Threatened his life? Would you say these signatures were genuine, Miss Clark? Let me see them. Of course they're genuine. Miss Harriet, I'm asking Miss Clark. Miss Clark saw their signatures oftener than you did. Well, Miss Clark? I think it's their signatures, Mr. Chameleon. You know they are, Carrie. Miss Clark, you sound frightened. Why are you frightened? I'm not. Really, I'm not. When I showed you the letters, you seemed surprised that each of these men said that he thought the other was planning to kill him. Didn't you ever hear them quarreling? Quarreling? Why, no, they seem the best of friends. Oh, you silly little girl, they wouldn't confide in you. Miss Harriet, have you ever purchased any poison, and where were you at the time of the murders? I was at home, Mr. Chameleon. I went home early. But why pick on me? I had no reason to kill them. There were half a dozen people who had more reason than I did. Name the half dozen. Harriet, we might as well tell him the truth. Yes. Who are you trying to protect, Mr. Thurston? Tell me who threatened to kill Thomas and Blifton. Miss Brown, give me those names. There was a Mrs. Grady and her son, Marcus. They have a little machine shop. Mrs. Grady invested the money her husband left her in some of our stocks and lost every penny. They made a terrible scene one day. Marcus Grady. Marcus Grady. Then there's a Scotchman, James MacDonald. He has a shop in this building on this very floor. He lost money too, Mr. Chameleon. He came in here recently waving a gun. Isn't that right, Carrie? Yes, Mr. Thurston. What business is James MacDonald in? He's an engraver. Oh, well, that means that he might be a forger and that he might have forged those letters supposedly sent to the police by the murdered partners Thomas and Blifton. But the signatures on those letters aren't forgeries. They're genuine. Yes, I'm sure they're genuine, Mr. Chameleon. And so is Carrie Clark. Aren't you, dear? If there are any questions to ask, Miss Clark, I will ask them. But, Mr. Chameleon, I've thought it over and I'm sure now those signatures are genuine. Oh? Just as Mr. Thurston and Miss Harriet said... I would like to know what you're afraid of, Miss Clark. Oh, why, nothing, Mr. Chameleon. From what I have seen in this office, Carrie, I would say the best life insurance you could have would be to tell me what you're afraid of. Oh, it's nothing. I warn you, Harriet Brown, and you, Thurston, if you intimidate or injure this girl in any way, I shall have you behind bars before you know it. Goodbye. Mr. Chameleon, are we going to question that engraver at McDonald now? No, no, Dave. The name Marcus Grady rings a bell in my memory. I want to question Marcus Grady and his mother first. And later, in the Grady shabby little flat, Mr. Chameleon stands facing a belligerent woman and her son. And he is saying to them, Don't play games with me, either of you. I happen to know, Mrs. Grady, that you had good reason to hate Thomas and Blifton. They had sold you worthless securities and you lost all your money. Yes, that's right. But I didn't kill them. Where were you last night, about 10 o'clock? The coroner claims Thomas and Blifton died at that hour. Is it not possible that you paid them another visit in an effort to get them to return some of your money? No. No, my mother and I were here at home. How the devil we get into that office building at night? Mr. Chameleon, what are you trying to do to us? I'm trying to catch a murderer. And I'm looking for a possible forger who may have forged Thomas and Blifton's signatures to two letters sent to the police. Forger? Uh Uh-huh. Went home, didn't it, Marcus? Well... The minute I heard your name, I remembered your case. You just missed being given a stiff sentence for forgery. Your youth and lack of complete evidence saved you. But I am certain that a forger is mixed up in this case. Well, don't look at me. I've tried to go straight. My mother and me, we've had this machine shop. And lost all your money to Thomas and Blifton. Okay, so I hate them. Both of us hated them. I'm glad they're dead. But just try and prove that we did it. Hello? 
Oh, hello, Miss Clark. Caddy Clark? Yeah, yeah, she wants to talk to you, Mr. Megan. Does she think we're guilty? I don't know, Mrs. Grady. Up to now, she's been too frightened to tell me what she thinks. Hello. Mr. Chameleon, this is Carrie Clark. I've got to talk fast. I want to see you. Oh, of course. Where are you, Miss Clark? In a drugstore across the street from our building. I was sure you were going to question the Gradys. That's why I called you there. Uh, Carrie, take a taxi and come to this address. You will see a police car outside and tell the driver that you are to wait for me. What does that girl want, Mr. Chameleon? That Miss Clark. She worked for Thomas and Blifton. She's as bad as they were. I doubt that. Right now, I think she's showing great courage. Where is your son? I don't know. Oh, yes, you do. He was listening in on the extension in his machine shop downstairs, wasn't he? Well, I can't stop now, but I am warning you, Mrs. Grady. Both you and your son are under suspicion of murder. And if you can discover any evidence, declare yourselves, you had better get it to me. Mr. Chameleon, I just got here with the analysis on that poison. Good. To show I was right, Dave, the poison in Thomas's glass was different from that in Blifton's? That's right, Mr. Chameleon. Uh -huh. And you still say they didn't kill each other? Maybe each guy slipped a little something into the other one's glass. A circumstance of that kind is too much for me to believe, Dave. The more I talk to the people involved in this case, the more I'm convinced that one of the cleverest murderers we have ever met is behind this job. Which one do you suspect, Mr. Chameleon? I suspect them all, Dave. In the meanwhile, I'm sure that Carrie Clark has part of the answer. Where is she? Waiting in the squad car? Yes, sir. Talking to Foley. There she is. Oh. Miss Clark? Miss Clark? Oh, Mr. Chameleon. Miss Clark? What have you to tell me? It's just this green blotter. I found it in Harriet Brown's waste paper basket. Look at it. Mm -hmm. Splendid, Carrie. The blotted signatures of Thomas and Blifton on it. On a green blotter in an office where I noticed only scarlet red blotters were used. Where do you think Harriet Brown got it, Carrie? She may have gotten it from James McDonald's office. That's the color blotter he uses. And I saw Harriet Brown in there day before yesterday. With McDonald? Yes, Mr. Chameleon. Did they know you saw them? Yes, they both spoke to me. So that is what you were afraid of, Carrie. Oh, I'm afraid of them all, Mr. Chameleon. Dave, you have a policewoman take this very brave girl to a hotel for the night. I don't want her alone in her room. Oh, but Mr. Chameleon... I simply want to make certain that you are alive tomorrow, my dear. Mr. Chameleon and the amazing Thomas and Blifton murder case continues in just a moment. Your own doctor will tell you that there's no reason in the world why you should suffer from the painful symptoms of a cold, especially when it's so easy to quickly relieve such symptoms as that headachey feeling and muscular aches and pains. Just take two Bayer aspirin tablets with a full glass of water and you get fast relief because Bayer aspirin is ready to go to work in two seconds. And if your cold is accompanied by a sore throat, gargle with three Bayer aspirin tablets dissolved in one-third of a glass of water. This highly potent medicinal gargle almost instantly soothes the tender throat membranes, relieves pain and irritation. So when you're suffering from painful cold symptoms, take two Bayer aspirin tablets with a full glass of water, and then to relieve accompanying sore throat, dissolve three Bayer tablets in one-third of a glass of water and gargle. When you buy, ask for Bayer aspirin, not just for aspirin alone. Get the 100-tablet bottle and you get Bayer aspirin tablets for less than a penny apiece. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the amazing Thomas and Blifton murder case. We find Mr. Chameleon and Detective Sergeant Dave Arnold about to enter the office of the engraver, James MacDonald, another suspect in the murder. In Mr. Chameleon's hand, there is a green blotter, and he is saying, Notice, Dave, the blotted signatures of Thomas and Blifton here exactly match the signatures on these letters the murdered men are supposed to have sent to the police. So the signatures are forged, right, Mr. Chameleon? Very cleverly forged, Dave. Now we're about to see James MacDonald, the man Carrie Clark says uses green blotters and was with... Harriet Brown day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. Knock on the door, Dave. We go in. What do you want? Uh, Mr. MacDonald, uh, we want to know if you will imitate the signature of a man for us. The exact signature. What man? Well, for the present, I'd rather not say. But you do that sort of work, don't you? Who told you that? Uh, what's the price? 
How about a um, hundred dollars? I asked you, who sent you here? Harriet Brown and Henry Thurston. So let's get started. There's nothing to be afraid of, MacDonald. I'm afraid of no man. Who the devil are you? I'm chameleon of the police. Get out before I throw you out. Both here. No, no, that now. It's or not else. you I'm after. It's this little wart here. Chameleon. Thank you, MacDonald. But I warn you, don't make yourself look any worse than you do. What's that? Here is a perfect example of the art of forgery, as a skilled engraver like you could execute it. Don't try any of that on me. A green blotter from your office, your fingerprints on it. Can't our man touch his own blotters? With the blotted and forged signatures of the two murdered men on it. One reads Thomas, the other Blifton. Why did you kill these men, MacDonald? They were filthy thieves. Whatever hand struck them down was the hand of justice. But I didn't kill them. This blotter is direct evidence, MacDonald, damning evidence of premeditated first-degree murder. Dave! Don't try any of that, MacDonald. I've got you covered. Now, MacDonald, it is the electric chair for you or for somebody else. Your out is to talk, and your only out, believe me. What do you want to know? I'll talk. Did Harriet Brown or Henry Thurston or both get you to forge these signatures of Thomas and Blifton on these two letters to the Commissioner of Police? Harriet Brown has been having me teach her the engraving business. But in my dead mother's name, I never saw these letters. Was Thurston trying to learn engraving too? No, I'd say he didn't need teaching. What exactly do you mean by that, MacDonald? I mean they were all a pack of thieves. Thomas, Blifton, Harriet Brown and Thurston. Filthy, stinking thieves. All except... Well, except who? Except that bonny lass, Kerry Clark. Thank you, Mr. MacDonald. I believe I understand your feelings. But after all, Thomas and Blifton and their unsavory crew defrauded you of nearly everything you had. Did they not? And by that are you saying I murdered them? See you again, Mr. MacDonald. But uh, before I go... Yes? You use acid poisons in your engraving work, don't you? Every engraver does, chameleon. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can bamboozle me into saying I don't. Thank you. Goodbye again, Mr. MacDonald. What? Mr. Chameleon, you... Harriet Brown. Well, what are you doing here? You coming to see MacDonald, or were you at the door listening to what MacDonald was telling me? I don't listen at doors. In case you didn't hear what MacDonald and I were talking about, I will tell you. It was about your learning the engraving business. So he told you that? Well, I did that to get in with him when I was trying to sell him some investments. And he also spoke about poisons. Did you learn that phase of the engraving business, too? What? Don't bother answering, Miss Harriet. I would not believe anything, and I mean anything, that you told me. Mr. Chameleon, whatever MacDonald told you was to protect himself. He's not so eccentric or dumb as he looks. But I can see there's no point talking to you. I'm going back to my office. <laughs> what do you make of that, Mr. Chameleon? Harriet Brown is a smooth operator, Dave. She puts up a good front. But back of that front, there is something going on, and I intend to find out what. What are you going to do? I'm coming into this building disguised as a new janitor, Judd Moss. Not too bright. Doesn't hear too well, either. The murderer is in one of these offices. And so Mr. Chameleon, in his disguise as Judd Morse, the new janitor, opens the door to Thomas and Blifton's office. He finds Harriet Brown and Henry Thurston talking earnestly together. And Mr. Chameleon speaks in the voice of Judd Morse. Good morning. Morning. Mind if I go through, uh, gather up the trash? Judd Morse, new janitor. You Mr. Thurston? You Miss Brown? Why, yes. I didn't know we had a new janitor. You know it now. <laughs> I, uh... Hey, there was a little, nice little killing around here lately. Which office? I can't see that that's any of your business. Huh? What's say, Mr. Thurston? I'm a little deep. Oh, go and collect the trash. There are two wastebaskets full. We've been weeding out papers. Yes, sir. First time I ever worked in a building where there's been a killing. <laughs> the old fool. Listen, Thurston. MacDonald has been talking to Chameleon. Well, what of it? Chameleon was trying to draw him out about poison. That's what, trying to tie us into it. Thomas and Blifton weren't killed by any poison MacDonald has in his place. Thurston, be still. Here comes that janitor again, and... And it just occurred to me... What just occurred to you? Shh, I'll tell you after he goes. Yeah, got quite a pile of stuff here, ain't you, Miss Brown? I told you we cleared out a lot of papers. Uh, what's that? Oh, nothing. Just take the stuff and go. Yes. Seems to me you, you folks thrown away an awful lot of stuff. Henry, that man, he isn't the new janitor. Huh? I'm sure it's Chameleon. Chameleon? The detective? 
You mean he's here in disguise? Yes, that's the way he works, you know. He's here to get evidence. We've got to do something. We'll do it. And late that night in the quiet office building, as Chameleon, disguised as the janitor, is about to make his nightly rounds, he says to Detective Sergeant Arnold, Dave, did you get the photographs of everybody entering or leaving McDonald's office? It was a cinch. They're being developed now. Then I have told you what else to do. I shall expect you back just as fast as you can make it. Mr. Chameleon, I don't like this. If there's any chance they've pierced your disguise... From this point on, it's a case of my getting the killer or his getting me. So keep your fingers crossed and get back here fast. Now, the two of them are working late tonight, going into that office. Mr. Janitor, Judd Morse. <laughs> Didn't expect to find you here this late, Mr. Thurston. <laughs> you either, Miss Brown. Oh, well, we're about finished now, Judd. Both feel pretty tired. Mr. Uh-huh. Thurston and I were just going to have a drink to brace us up a bit. You look like you could do with one yourself, Judd. Shall I mix one for you, Judd? We, uh, we won't tell the boss on you. <laughs> Don't mind if I do. Uh, sure you won't tell the boss, though. He's, he's pretty strict on drink. Mix up three, Harry. Watch how fast I am, Judd. Yeah. Here's yours, Judd. Good health to you. Ah, thanks. Here goes. <gasps> hey, what is this? I feel sick. Terrible sick. I... I... Goodbye, Mr. Chameleon. When they find your body, we'll be far away. Come on, Harriet, let's get out. Try to get out and you'll be dead before you reach the door. What's this? Hands up and don't move. What have you done, Thurston? Are you crazy? Did you think Chameleon would stand by and let you poison him? What did you think he was doing, Harriet? Tell your story and remember your life depends on it. I saw through your disguise, Mr. Chameleon, and was fool enough to tell Thurston. He said he'd try to dope you long enough to destroy evidence against him in this office. The evidence that he was a third partner in Thomas and Blifton? Yes, and the evidence that they were planning to throw him to the police when the DA came after them. She's lying to save her own neck, Chameleon. She bought the poison that killed those two men. And you sneaked into McDonald's office, Thurston, and got the poison you put in my glass to kill me tonight. Trying to plant the poison on me, Thurston, you filthy hound. I'll tear you apart with my bare hands. Easy, McDonald. Let me finish. Harriet Brown and McDonald are the murderers, Chameleon. No use, Thurston. I have got you trapped. Here is a picture Detective Arnold took showing you sneaking out of McDonald's office with the poison to kill me. You can't prove it was poison. Was a glass of plain water. Save it, Thurston. You bought the poison, too, that killed your partners, Thomas and Blifton. Been traced to you. And you bought it in the name of H. Brown to put the murder on Harriet Brown. Right, Detective Arnold? The insecticide place that sold it identified H. Brown as a man. And identified your photograph, Thurston, as that man. I'll kill all of you before I let you take me. Your days of killing are over. Handcuff him, Dave. And don't fail to give him credit for being a very clever criminal. Clever enough to send two forged letters to the police from Thomas and Blifton, asking protection against each other, leaving him free to kill them. Much better than an alibi. And I was afraid you were going to arrest me, Mr. Chameleon. The innocent Miss Harriet, no matter how little they deserve it, must be protected, and the guilty must be punished. Come on, Dave. Let's take Thurston on his last ride. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. It's only natural that when you have an ordinary headache, you want fast relief. And to find out how quickly Bayer aspirin is ready to go to work, all you need do is test it in a glass of water. What happens to Bayer aspirin in the glass also happens in your stomach and the speed with which it disintegrates indicates the speed with which it's ready to go to work. When you make this test, you'll see that Bayer aspirin starts disintegrating almost instantly, is actually ready to go to work in two seconds, hence it provides remarkably fast relief. So when you need something to relieve pain, be sure of how quickly it will act. Be sure with Bayer aspirin. When you buy, ask for Bayer aspirin, not just for aspirin alone. Get the 100-tablet bottle and you get Bayer Aspirin tablets for less than a penny apiece. (laughs) 
Listen next Wednesday night at the same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces, in the case of the bewildering body on the Bowery. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson and written by Frank and Ann Hummert from the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. Music directed by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. After years of work, a revolutionary new toothpaste has been developed called Lion's Toothpaste. By actual laboratory tests on scores of individual teeth, it gets teeth two and a half to five and a half times brighter than any of the five leading brands, brighter by far than any other toothpaste. New Lion's Toothpaste does this because it's a new kind of toothpaste with a formula that's completely new and radically different. A remarkable toothpaste that cleans without soap and polishes without chalk. Try it. Ask for Lion's Toothpaste. Listen for Mr. Chameleon in the case of the bewildering body on the Bowery next Wednesday at this time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Mr. Chameleon may have been taking a slight risk leaving his life totally dependent on Dave Arnold showing up on time, but all they had available as potential support were second string policemen. And these guys only did special teams. I mean, second string policemen. I mean, did Frank Hummer just assume that Police departments work like football teams. I also wondered a bit about the last ride thing. Because they were just arresting the guy. Isn't the last ride the term for the ride before they go to the death house? Technically, he hasn't even been charged. Or are they trying out a pilot program where Chameleon gets to be judge, jury, and executioner? Is this the Hummert vs. Origin of Judge Dredd? Uh, anyway, other than that, a pretty good number of suspects in this one, and I was glad that the innocent office girl didn't get killed before she could tell her story, as often happens when witnesses want to get to Mr. Chameleon with information. Also, I love Chameleon's takedown of the man who turned out to be the killer for claiming it took six years for him to figure out things were a bit shady at the Thomas and Blifton firm. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we have an email from Julie regarding the handprint on the ceiling murder case. She writes, Hi, Adam, just finished listening to this episode, and I appreciated your comments after it. I actually laughed all the way through this one, thinking Mr. Chameleon must have been hangry or something because he seemed to just start the episode yelling and kept it up all the way through. I've always felt like S Detective Sergeant Dave Arnold is treated as the slow-witted sidekick as he is billed in some articles on old-time radio. I really like his character, though. In this episode, when he said whoopee, when <laughs> Chameleon said he'd figured something out, I had to rewind and make sure I'd heard that right. Another bout of laughter. Mr. Chameleon's last comments to the murderer about writing a short book about dumb policemen because he wouldn't have time to write a long one really got me chuckling. It's always interesting, especially in Dragnet or Tales of the Texas Rangers, where they actually tell you how quickly the murderer was executed in old-time radio to see how quickly justice was done, when in our current age, convicted murderers might remain on death row for years and years. Uh, thanks for the laughs, and always your insights and comments are fun and entertaining. Well, thanks so much, Julie. And it is remarkable to hear how quickly the death penalty worked. Uh, in my home state of Idaho, we may have an execution at the end of the month of a man who has been on death row since 1983. 41 years is an incredibly long time for a state to have someone pending execution. 
and definitely far more than you'd hear in a Golden Age radio program. Of course, with the death penalty, it's always a touchy issue, and I understand that there's debates, particularly as we've had evidence come forward to clear people who have been on death row, that this is a really controversial subject. And the question of whether the appeals are good or bad, but it's definitely a very different situation in our modern world. Then we have a review on good pods of the same episode, and Alexis writes, Chameleon is so shouty. And I would agree, yes he is. Though, in this episode, he seemed to be a little bit more restrained. I don't know whether that was the script or if that was Carl Swenson trying to save his voice a little. He did a lot of acting, and who knows, he may have come into Mr. Chameleon and said, okay, I'm gonna have to not shout so much today. I've had other gigs, and I just cannot do the full chameleon today. And regarding the dinner of death, Terry writes on YouTube, very enjoyable. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you so much, Terry. I appreciate you listening on YouTube. And now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Sean. Sean has been one of our Patreon supporters since June of 2018, currently supporting the podcast at the Detective Sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Sean, and that will do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software, and be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you download it from. We will be back next Thursday with another episode of Mr. Chameleon, but join us back here tomorrow for the conclusion of this week's Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Serial, where... Forgetting it was one of your own townspeople who asked me to come here, and for her own protection? That's what I got to thinking about after you left. So I decided maybe I better talk to you. And, well, that's how I happened to go over to Meg's place tonight. Was that you I saw in the shadows out by the front door? Yes, sir. I, I was waiting for Captain Billy Morgan and his crew to finish cleaning up the place for Meg. Then I was going to go in and talk to you. And that's the truth, Mr. Dollar. Go on. Well, I just got there when I heard a noise out at the side of the cafe like a fight. Of course, it was dark. There was no fight. Somebody came out the side door from behind me and knocked me on the head. Yeah. So I took you up and put you on your bed and gave you time to get your senses back and then telephone to you. Uh-huh. You sure it was you out at the front of the cafe? Oh, no, Mr. Dolly. You trying to implicate maybe it was me that give you a belaying pin over the head? Was that what hit me, Beasley? A belaying pin? I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.